Romans and chapter 7. We'll just read the first uh, six verses and see how we go. <coughs> we may read on if time permits. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that she should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. But when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So Paul begins here, he's been talking about uh, being delivered from the law by the body of Christ. If you look back at chapter 6 and verse 15, uh, what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace God forbid so we're not under the law because we died to the law with the Lord Jesus Christ and he's going to flesh that out a little bit more now and then he'll go on in this chapter to speak of uh, how the law excites sin in us and it begins by saying I speak to them that know the law now that suggests to me that uh, there were, in fact I'm pretty sure it's the case, there were plenty of Jews at Rome. But it suggests to me also that many of those believed at Rome had some who believed at Rome, that's Gentiles as well, must have had some familiarity with the law. Uh, some have said it should read, I speak to them that no law, uh, but I don't correct the King James Bible. Um, it says the law, and the context is the law, um, and so the law it is and therefore I think we're helped to understand that by the fact that there were many Jews probably amongst the believers at Rome and then he goes on to say in verse 2 the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so this is the law of God uh, as, as given by Moses so long as he liveth but if the husband be dead she is loosed from the law of her husband so then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man she shall be called an adulteress but if her husband be dead she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man now again many preachers will dismiss this as having nothing to do with uh, marriage the marriage state and remarriage and so on and so forth I can't really go along with that it seems to me that Paul is using the same argument that the Lord Jesus used um, and I, I greatly sympathise, truly I greatly sympathise with those brothers whose wives maybe have stepped out, as the Americans like to say, on them or have, have left them, or indeed with those sisters whose husbands have stepped out on them. I sympathise with all that, uh, but I personally, and you're welcome to disagree if you can justify yourself out of the Scriptures, uh, it is my personal view that the teaching of the New Testament is if a man's a Christian man's wife dies, he is not to marry. Sorry, if she if she leaves him, he is not to remarry until she dies. And the same with the uh, woman whose husband leaves her. It's, it puts the, the brother or the sister, I understand, in a very very difficult place. And I know one in particular, a, a fine saint. Uh, a fine man of God whose wife was from what I know of her was a bit of a Harridan and uh, he was as gentle as they come a lovely brother but she was something of a Harridan and in the end she left him and he was years and years and years on his own trying to look after himself um, and in the end he, he married now what his argument is for that I've not, not asked him and I don't think it's my, I don't think it's my place to ask him um, 
But I, I have to say, I do greatly sympathise with that situation, but I cannot see any scriptural justification for a believer to marry again whilst his former life, his former wife lives and the same with the other way around. And this is what Paul is saying here. The woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband, so then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, but she should be called uh, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she's no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, he's going to apply this to our relationship to the law and our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives this um, these two verses and this this example from the law in order to apply it to what's happened to us uh, who have believed. And clearly the, the spiritual meaning of this is that you cannot be both saved by works and by grace. The spiritual application, what the apostle seems to me to be fairly clearly saying, is that you cannot be joined to the law, as it were. You cannot be wedded to the law um, and also to the Lord Jesus Christ. To do so is spiritual adultery. Um we are either saved by works or we are saved by grace and there the twain shall meet uh, we cannot say that we're saved by grace if we suppose we're saved by works or if we live as though we're saved by works it's a precious one of the great precious things of course of the gospel is that our works do not bring us into, into salvation and therefore they cannot lose us our salvation we never got it by works so doing or not doing works will not take it away. It was the gift of God's grace because of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So having died to the law through Christ, in fact, we better read verse 4 because that's what we're teaching next. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So first of all, we're told that we have become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now this means not the church, the body of Christ, not the church here, the body of Christ is his body, his body of flesh. And because we were joined to him, when we, when we believe we were made one with him, so that as we've seen in chapter 6, his death became our death, his resurrection became our resurrection, and therefore we are dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now the Lord Jesus... Uh, of course lived a perfect sinful life he asked his enemies which of you accuseth me of sin and they couldn't so when he died he died not for his own sins for he had none he died for ours as Isaiah 53 and many and many and many other places teaches us um, but in taking our sins upon himself he took the judgment of the law upon himself answered it for us and therefore through him we have become dead to the law. Uh, now this is connected back with uh, the former husband and uh, what we learn from the, the previous chapter is that uh, not that sin has died but that our, uh, we have died let me get this right now uh, we have died to sin. The old man the power of the old man no longer rules in us. We are dead to that. Um, and so we become dead to the law by the body of Christ the law can do nothing now it can, you know, if a man goes to court um, uh, and is found guilty and the penalty is death if, if he's hung there's nothing more that can be charged against him of course it's answered and the Lord Jesus answered it for us and therefore there is no charge uh, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Let me get the words right from chapter 8. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So we became dead to the law, verse 4 of chapter 7, by the body of Christ that you should be married to another. So we died to the law in his death, but we were married to him in his resurrection. 
So the law, the, the union that we had with the old man under the law is broken by the death of Christ and we with him. And now being raised with him, we are married to him. And he goes on to say that we should bring forth fruit unto God. I suppose there are those, I, I think there are those who, who call themselves Christians who think, I've, I've got saved, that's it. But God is looking for fruit from us. That we should bring forth fruit unto God. That fruit is described for us in Galatians 5.23 where we read about such things as love and joy and peace. And also I believe it would have to do with praise, the fruit of our lips, offering praise to God. It would also include the winning of souls as fruit to God. So we're not, we're not saved just to sit in our houses uh, and uh, just, what shall we say, wallow in our salvation, delight in our salvation. We're saved that we might bring forth fruit. You probably know the story. Uh, I'll probably preach on it here. I'm not just sure. About those four lepers that sat outside the gate of Syria during the famine. They weren't allowed in the city because they were lepers. The Syrians, uh, sorry, the, no, the city was Samaria. The Syrians were surrounding the Israelites in Samaria and starving them to death. Uh, and you can read it in, I think it's 2 Kings chapter 5. Um, and the situation in the city of Samaria was was horrendous and they were starving to death they were eating their babies this is what you know I preach all I did was preach what the Bible said and they got so mad in one church they all phoned the elder up and said don't you know we don't want to hear that again all I done was preach what the Bible says they had come to that dreadful place where as the Lord warned in the Lord of Moses they were eating one another they were eating their children the mothers were eating their babies that might be unsavory and it won't go down in most churches, but it's in the Bible. And I'm not going to dwell on that, but the point I'm trying to make is there were four lepers that sat outside that city. And they used a bit of logic one day, and they said, well, if we, go, if we stay here, we're going to die. And if we go to the Syrians, we're going to die. So I'm putting this in language that you might read maybe in the Message or the Living Bible. Let's chance our arm among the Syrians so they decide to go into the Syrian camp thinking at least we might get something to eat and they find as you know that the camp is vacant that they have fled that all the provisions are there the tents are there they've just fled in fear and terror because the Lord has sent a noise that had frightened them and the camp was empty the Syrians were gone and so these men, they begin to go into one tent, they take the spoil, they find something, and they go from tent to tent, gathering up spoil, having some, and then they suddenly come to their senses and say, we do not well. We ought to go back to the city and tell them. And we are lepers who have been cleansed. We are lepers who have found food. We are lepers who have found riches. We ought to go and tell those that are starving in the city. I think... If I remember rightly, this was pretty much the gist of my message that night uh, that got me, uh, made me so unpopular, or even more unpopular than I already was. Um, but those men, and there were four of them, always makes me think of the four evangelists. Four men also carried the ark, you remember. Uh, I often think the number of four is, is to do with the world, of course. The number four connects with the world. The gospel is to go into all the earth. There are four evangelists. Uh, and there were four of these lepers. And they went back, like evangelists, if you will, to tell them in Samaria. We were talking about fear on Sunday, or I was, and how that uh, it has a strange power. It has a terrible, horrendous power over us. When often things that the things that we when often times the things that we fear are not there. They were still trembling in Samaria. The Syrians had gone, and when the uh, lepers came and told them, they had a hard job believing. So they were still starving in the city. They were still trembling in the city, but there was no threat. And uh, really, isn't it rather like the message that we preach? The Lord Jesus has taken the danger away. 
There isn't a threat if you'll come to him, if you'll just believe the message. The threat of his wrath has gone. But they continue, so many of them, to tremble in the city for fear of God. So we're told that we should bring forth fruit unto God, and those lepers are an example to us. And it goes on in verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Now he's going to open this up more fully as we go. We won't get into the full opening of it tonight. But the motions of sins which were by the law. In 1 Corinthians 15, round about verse 56, we read, uh, the law is the strength of sin. And he will go on in this chapter to explain to us that what the law does is it aggravates the sin in us. And instead of checking that sin in us, the sin in us rebels against it. And so this is what he means when he says the motions of sins which were by the law. They were stirred up by the law. I told the story, didn't I, was it last week, about the man who kept cussing Adam and he was told to work in the garden. And he was told you, his master was going away, he said you can have the run of the house, you can eat what you like, you can watch what you like, you make yourself at home, sleep in the master bed. But there's a box there, don't touch it, on the side. And that lasted for a certain amount of time and then that temptation just got too much. That command not to touch that box just got too much. And that's the way the law works. It's too much for our sinful flesh. We need grace. Um, and of course, what this does then, uh, when we were in the flesh, the most of sins which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death so before there was fruit unto death we're told we should bring forth fruit unto God this is also the teaching that we looked at um, in the, at the end of chapter 6 if you look back just remind you verse 21 what fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed for the end of those things is death and I spoke of some of the fruit of my early life as a drummer the wicked fruit that that brought forth but then he goes on to say but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And then verse 6, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So we're delivered from the law, and then there's this difficult phrase here, that, uh, that, that being dead wherein we were held. Now, I've, many times over the years, I've asked myself, quite what is it that dies here? Because I haven't died. Uh, sin hasn't died. But, well, I haven't died. I've died to sin. Uh, and yet I'm alive to God. So, quite precisely what it is uh, that's dead here, that being dead where we were held, is presumably the old man. That's one possibility. It might be the marriage contract because you remember we're thinking about this first few verses um, the husband and the wife and the wife dies to the husband so we read that being dead where we were held well the wife hasn't died uh, so I, I think uh, it's, it's a difficult one but it seems to me that sin has died but even then I'm not, I'm not altogether sure about that if, you, if you've got any answers, we'll, we'll talk about them afterwards. But the, the point is that uh, death has come in, we read this from, from chapter 6, so that we have become dead to the law. That we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, you know, you can serve in the oldness of the letter even using the New Testament. Uh, you can serve in the oldness of the letter even using the Sermon on the Mount, uh, chapters 5, 6 and 7 of Romans the word is only the word in its powerful sense when it's ministered by the spirit sometimes we might take a word might we out of context and misuse it we might read a verse in scripture and think we need to do this or we need to do that but it needs to be taught by the spirit there needs to be this newness of spirit not merely the oldness of the letter it isn't enough just to have as it were the bare text we need the spirit to bring that to life to us and through us the word of god is dead without the spirit of god they always work together 
Now we know that the word of God is living and powerful, but it is always connected to the God, to the Lord Himself. That's why, once you sever the word from Him, and from His teaching and from His intentions, then you're you're dealing with a dead letter. You're trying to serve in the oldness of the letter. It might be this that the Lord Jesus is referring to when He spoke about you remember the wine skins uh, and the the patch on the garment. That you, the New Testament is so different from the old. You can't, you can't patch the old up with the new. They're different. They're completely different. Uh, and so you can't just improve the old life by put a patch on it. And thank God we're not asked to. We're given a new life. Uh, it's a completely new garment, if you will. And so perhaps this is what the Lord has in mind there when He speaks of, when we read here of newness of spirit and the oldness of the letter. Now, he's going to go on to talk about the law more fully. I'm going to break here because uh, really the argument needs to be looked at uh, as a piece, as a whole piece. Uh, But he's going to go on to argue now more fully about how, just how, I've already touched on it, uh, the law stirs up sin. And then the question would arise, what shall we say, that is the law sin? And he's going to explain that that isn't. Uh, there's nothing wrong with reading, reading the law there's nothing wrong with reading Genesis through Deuteronomy just because we're under grace doesn't mean we don't read the Old Testament uh, much of the New Testament is made alive by the old and indeed much of the old is made alive by the new we interpret each with the other for example just, uh, just one or two examples um, thou shalt not wear the garments of woolen and linen together says Moses well, what's that all about? What's that got to do with you and me wearing garments of wool and linen? Well, wool speak, wool brings forth sweat, you see, and wool speaks of labour. Linen are the garments that the righteous wear. This speaks of grace. You can't wear both. That's what he says at the start of Romans 7. You cannot be of works and of grace. You cannot wear a garment. I'm not saying you shouldn't today. You might think you should. That's fine if you want to do that. All I'm saying is the spiritual significance is Wool breaks, causes sweat. And the Lord has said, you shall not wear anything that causes sweat. And he told Moses that the garments were to be made of linen, that there be no sweat. And in another place he says, there shall no flesh be seen on the altar. A word for today. Uh, And so on, we could take many little verses like that from the Old Testament, and they have a spiritual significance. So we shouldn't neglect the Old Testament. We need to understand that the law is good, which Paul's going to explain uh, next week, God willing, if we're not in the glory. I hope we're in the glory, but we might not be. Um, So that we 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 need to know the law, we need to understand the law, because the law will give us a good idea of what is acceptable to God and what isn't, even for us Gentiles. There are things in the law, of course, that apply strictly to Israel. Uh, I would say the Sabbath, for example, what they called the Sabbath, which was a Saturday. I do not think Gentiles have to keep the Saturday as a Sabbath. Personally, I don't think Gentiles have to keep the Sabbath Sunday as a Sabbath either. I believe those things were for Israel. Paul never tells us anywhere to keep the Sabbath. Nevertheless, for what I always do is I try and have, I mean, these days I've got seven days off a week, but when I was working, I wouldn't work Sunday because I felt that a man should always have a day off every week, he needs to rest and Sunday's the great day because we can come to church but there is no law about that Paul never teaches, so far as I can see anywhere in the New Testament that Christians could keep what they call the Sabbath uh, the Sunday Sabbath it's not in the Bible but Israel was was to do that there were dietary requis- uh, requirements that Israel had to keep that I do not believe we are bound to keep anymore Good men better than I have said it, and, and I have seen fix this, it's okay to eat pork. Fine, God bless you. But but generally speaking, the, the dietary rules, um, I mean, I think of others, there's uh, Pat Curry never touched pork, and he was a man of God, and there's Lester Roloff, who's another great American man, never touched pork. So I don't fall out with brethren over that, but nevertheless, the dietary rules are for Israel. We are told by, in the New Testament that all things are pure uh, we shouldn't fall out with brothers that eat this or eat that or don't eat this or don't eat that we're under grace you see uh, but that doesn't mean to say the law is an ass 
It doesn't mean to say the law is totally defunct as far as we're concerned. There's a great deal we can learn from the law, which is really heightened in the teachings of Jesus and which is explained in the epistles of Paul. But we'll leave it there for tonight. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.